America is in the midst of critical events, the likes of which we've never seen before. In these increasingly divided times leading up to the 2020 election, now more than ever, we need to join together and pray for America. From best-selling author Dr. Robert Jeffress comes Praying for America, a collection of 40 inspirational stories and 40 intentional prayers for our great nation. Request Praying for America by Dr. Robert Jeffress when you give a generous gift to support the ministry of Pathway to Victory today. Listen long enough to the arguments of the American Civil Liberties Union or the Freedom From Religion Foundation or other left-wing groups, and you will come to believe this version of America, America's history. You'll come to believe that America was founded by a wide diversity of people from many different faiths. Some deists, some atheists, and yes, a few Christians. But the founders had one goal, and that was to build a completely secular nation that was devoid of any religious, especially Christian influence whatsoever. You'll be told that our founders wanted to erect this unscalable wall around our country that would keep any spiritual influence from seeping into public life. That version of American history belongs in the same category as the story of George Washington and the cherry tree. It is an absolute myth. As we're going to discover today, the truth is America was founded primarily, not exclusively, but by primarily by Orthodox Christians. And they founded this country upon the unchanging foundation of God's eternal truth. And furthermore, our founders believed that our success as a nation depended upon our faithfulness to God's eternal word. And though it, is, though it is completely politically incorrect to say, the truth is this, America was founded as a Christian nation. And our success as a nation depends upon our fidelity to God's word. Now today, we are going to look at the historical evidence by which we can say that America was truly founded as a Christian nation. You won't hear this in the secular media. You won't hear this in the classroom. But you will come to understand the historical truth when I'm finished today. First of all, let's look at the spiritual beliefs of our founders. Were they neutral toward Christianity? Hardly. 52 of the 55 men who attended the Constitutional Convention were Orthodox, conservative Christians. In fact, two of those founders who attended the Constitutional Convention, Elias Boudinot and John Jay, the first Chief Justice of our Supreme Court later, went on to be the head of the American Bible Society. And the purpose of the American Bible Society was to distribute the Bible to as many people as possible, believing that the message of the Bible would transform lives and set the nation on a proper moral course. Yes, two of our founders were deists. And make no mistake about it, deists are not Christians. Two of our founders, Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin, were deists. But even these men understood the importance of a spiritual foundation for our country. It's interesting that Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin worked together to create, to propose a national seal for our country. Do you know what that national seal was? It was a depiction of Moses leading the children of Israel out of Egypt following God, the pillar of cloud. Benjamin Franklin believed that the Continental Congress should begin the session seeking the favor of God through prayer. Franklin said, quote, I have lived, sir, a long time, and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth, that God governs the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? We have been assured, sir, in the sacred writings that except the Lord build, they labor in vain that build it. 
That was Benjamin Franklin. Consider also the state constitutions. Every state had their own constitution. And almost all of the 13 colonies prior to the Constitutional Convention had a state-sponsored religion. To attend the Constitutional Convention, every delegate from every state had to meet certain criteria. All had religious tests for office. Did you know that? All of the states who appointed people to go to the Constitution uh, Convention, they had a religious test of faith. I'm not saying that was right. Today, Article 6 of the Constitution prohibits a religious test of faith. But remember the argument. The argument is that our founders were predominantly Christians who wanted to build this nation on Christian principles. And you see this in the qualifications that every state had to go to the Constitutional Convention. For example, if you were from Delaware and you wanted to hold public office in the state of Delaware, if you wanted to go to the Constitutional Convention, listen to one of the things you had to subscribe to. Article 22 of the Delaware Convention said, quote, every person who shall be chosen a member of either house or appointed to any office or place of trust shall make and subscribe to the following declaration. I do profess faith in God the Father and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, and in the Holy Ghost, one God blessed forevermore. And I do acknowledge the Holy Scriptures to the Old and New Testament to be given by divine inspiration. Today, we don't even require some seminary professors to believe that. But if you lived in Delaware and wanted to hold public office, you had to believe that. You know, a few years ago, two professors from the University of Houston, da Donald Lutz and Charles Heinemann, engaged in a research project to discover whom our founding fathers quoted the most. And they thought if they could find out whom the founding fathers were quoting the most, they could understand better their principles. And so after 10 years of studying more than 15,000 documents, these professors found that the three men our founding fathers quoted most often were British philosopher John Locke, French philosopher Baron Montesquieu, and English judge Sir William Blackstone. However, they found, our founding fathers cited the Bible four times more than they quoted Montesquieu or Blackstone and 12 times more than they quoted John Locke. Indeed, more than a third of all of the founding fathers' quotes came directly from the Bible. And another 60% came from those authors who, had their <clears throat> who based their writings on the Bible. In fact, the founders referenced the Bible more than all of the other Enlightenment authors combined. And it's that truth that led Ken Woodward of Newsweek magazine in an article titled, How the Bible Made America, to make this amazing concession. Uh, he said, quote, Now historians are discovering that the Bible, even perhaps more than the Constitution, is our nation's founding document. That comes from Newsweek magazine. Read carefully the testimony of our founding fathers who gave their life's blood for this nation, and you'll discover a devotion to God. <clears throat> now let me say, there are a lot of people, Christians out there, quoting the founding fathers to make this point that America is a Christian nation. And many of the quotes they have used have turned out to be spurious, fictitious quotes. And so for today's message, we went back and double-checked, and we triple-checked, and we went back to the original sources to make sure that these quotes were 100% accurate. Just listen, for example, to George Washington in his first inaugural speech. He said, it would be improper to omit in this first official act my fervent supplications to that almighty being. No people can be bound to acknowledge and adore the invisible hand which conducts the affairs of men more than the people of the United States. Or consider the words of the second president of the United States, John Adams. 
He said the general principles on which the fathers achieved independence were the general principles of Christianity. I will avow that I then believed and now believe that those general principles of Christianity are as eternal and immutable as the existence and the attributes of God and that those principles of liberty are as unalterable as human nature. Or consider this amazing observation by Adams. He said, our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. John Jay, as I said, was the first chief justice of the United States Supreme Court. He was the co-author of the Federalist Papers. He said, providence, they referred to God as providence, has given our people the choice of their rulers. And it is the duty as well as the privilege and interest of our Christian nation to select and to prefer Christians for their rulers. Boy, today he would be hauled into court and sued down to his socks for making a statement like that. But this is the first chief justice of our Supreme Court. John Quincy Adams, the son of John Adams, was the sixth president of the United States. You won't believe what he said about the Christian foundation of our nation. He asked, why is it that next to the birthday of the Savior of the world, your most joyous and most venerated festival returns this day, July 4? Is it not that in the chain of human events, the birthday of the nation is indissolubly linked with the birthday of the Savior? Is it not that the Declaration of Independence first organized the social compact on the foundation of the Redeemer's mission upon earth? That it laid the cornerstone of human government upon the first precepts of Christianity? That was John Quincy Adams. Perhaps the most amazing quote by John Quincy Adams is one that has been disputed by some. So we went back to find the source of this and we found this quote appeared in a publication of Harvard University in 1860. So if I'm wrong, Harvard University is wrong too. But we're not wrong. This is what John Quincy Adams said, quote, the highest the transcendent glory of the American Revolution was this, that it connected in one indissoluble bond the principles of civil government and the precepts of Christianity. If it has never been considered in that light, it is because its compass has not been perceived. Do you hear that? There is an indissoluble bond between the founding of our country and Christianity. That was John Quincy Adams. You say, well, pastor, what about the wall of separation between the church and the state? I thought that was the founding principle of our nation. I was talking to a reporter this week, and he asked the very same thing. He said, pastor, what about the Constitution and the separation of church and state? I said, that's not found anywhere in the Constitution. He said, what? I said, look at the Constitution. Never once do you find the words, the separation of church and state. And yet today, 69% of Americans still believe that that phrase is found somewhere in the Constitution. It's not in the Constitution. And we'll see in just a moment where that phrase originated. In fact, the first mention of that phrase, the wall of separation between church and state, doesn't appear in a government document. It appears in a private letter from newly elected President Thomas Jefferson and a group of Baptists in Danbury, Connecticut. In 1801, almost every state, as I said, had a state-sponsored religion. Even after the First Amendment, was ratified in 1792. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of a religion. Even seven years after that, most every state had a state-sponsored religion. They were Christian denominations. They were Christian religions, but they were different denominations according to the state in which you lived. 
It so happened in Connecticut that the Congregational Church was the state-sponsored denomination in the state of Connecticut. And so part of people's tax dollars in Connecticut went to support the Congregational Church. Well, the Baptists didn't like that very much. And so they would petition the government every year for the tax dollars that had gone to the Congregational Church to be redirected toward their church. And they were tired of having to go through that hassle. So when Thomas Jefferson became president on January the 1st, 1802, the Danbury Baptist wrote President uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson a letter. Pardon me, on January 1st, 1802, Thomas Jefferson wrote this letter in response to their earlier letter. And listen to what he said. I contemplate with sovereign reverence that act of the whole American people which declared that their legislature should make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. He's quoting the First Amendment. Thus building a wall of separation between church and state. Now I want you to notice the context. The context had to do with the establishing of one Christian denomination as the state religion, which people were coerced to support financially. And it was in that context that Thomas Jefferson said, no, we are not to establish a state church that coerces people to worship. We're not to elevate one Christian denomination over another. That is clearly the context. Never in Jefferson's wildest imagination, nor in any of the founders' imagination, would that First Amendment ever be used as a tool to separate our nation from its Christian heritage. That was never the intent of Jefferson or anyone else. You say, how do you know that, Pastor? Well, just look at Jefferson's actions after he wrote that letter back. One year after writing that letter, then President Thomas Jefferson authorized the use of tax revenue to support a priest ministering to the Kaskaskia Indians. Uh, that was no wall of separation between church and state. Tax dollars were being used to support a priest. Two days after Thomas Jefferson wrote that letter to those Baptists in Danbury, Connecticut, two days after that, on January 3rd, 1802, we have the record. I've seen it myself. I've seen the record that Thomas Jefferson went to the Capitol for a worship service. And he attended a worship service in the Capitol building. You know why he did that? Because it was President Thomas Jefferson who authorized the use of the Capitol for the first church services in Washington, D.C., that continued years and decades after that time. Jefferson often went to a Christian church service in the Capitol that he authorized. Again, today the Supreme Court would have been suing Thomas Jefferson for using government facilities in order to promote the Christian faith. And yet, Thomas Jefferson saw no conflict between doing that and the First Amendment. Look at the early court rulings in addition to the utterances of our founding fathers. I mentioned just several of these cases that show that not only did our judiciary affirm our Christian foundation, but they also encouraged government support of the Christian faith. First of all, the case of Runkel versus Weinmiller in 1799. In that case, the Supreme Court of Maryland said in its decision, quote, by our form of government, the Christian religion is the established religion. Now stop there and think about that. This is seven years, just seven years, after the First Amendment that says Congress shall make no law regarding the establishment of religion. And now, seven years later, the, United, or the Maryland Supreme Court says we have an established religion in this country. It is the Christian religion. Were these judges ignorant of the First Amendment? Of course they weren't. They understood the First Amendment better than you do, better than I do, and certainly better than some liberal judge does today. The founders were still alive, the framers of the Constitution. If there was any question, the Maryland Supreme Court could have gone and asked the founders what they mean. 
No, they said, we have an established religion, but look at the second phrase. And all sects and denominations of Christians are placed upon the same equal footing and are equally entitled to protection in their religious liberty. What they were saying was, yes, we have an established faith, the Christian faith, but no Christian denomination is to be elevated over another Christian denomination. That, again, was the intent of the First Amendment. And will you notice here, this Supreme Court of Maryland said, the goal of the First Amendment is the protection of religious expression, not the restriction of religious expression. Something our courts need to understand today. Our Founding fathers had no interest whatsoever in restricting nativity scenes, Bible reading, prayer. That wasn't the goal of the First Amendment. It was to protect religious liberty, not to restrict it. The second case, a court case, the Church of the Holy Trinity versus the United States, 1892. This was a case that went before the United States Supreme Court. The case dealt with a church that was being sued by the government for employing a pastor from England which supposedly violated federal immigration law. Even a hot topic back then. <laughs> that amazing, some things never change. But anyway, they were going to sue uh, this church for hiring a preacher from England. The United States Supreme Court rejected that application of law to the church. And listen to what the Supreme Court said. They said no purpose or action against religion can be imputed to any legislation, state or national, because this is a religious people. This is historically true. From the discovery of this continent to the present hour, there is one single voice making this affirmation. And then the court recited a plethora of evidence that this nation was founded on Christian principles. And then the court said this, quote, these and many other matters which might be noticed add a volume of unofficial declarations to the mass of organic utterances that this is a Christian nation, the United States Supreme Court. This is a Christian nation. Don't tell the billboard company that. This is a Christian nation. Oh, have you heard all the liberal lamenting of that this week? Oh, those words are so divisive, Pastor. They're so hateful. I can't imagine those words coming from the lips of Jesus. Well, they came from the lips of the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, as we look at history, this is a Christian nation. In fact, notice what else they said. They quoted, thirdly, a case from the New York State Supreme Court, the People versus Ruggles. The Supreme Court in 1892 reached back to a prior court ruling in New York to substantiate their view and uh, listen to what they quoted and affirmed in the Supreme Court decision. Say, they said, quote, nor are we bound by any expressions in the Constitution as some have strangely supposed either not to punish at all or to punish indiscriminately the like attacks upon the religion of Mahatmat, that is Islam, or of the Grand Lama, that is Buddhism. And for this plain reason that the case assumes that we are a Christian people. And the morality of the country is deeply engrafted upon Christianity and not upon the doctrines of worship of those imposters. Isn't that an amazing ruling affirmed by the United States Supreme Court? Not only to say that this nation is engrafted upon the principles of Christianity, but other non-Christian religions, Islam, Buddhism, are imposter religions. Again, the argument I'm making today is that our nation was founded upon Christianity, and our forefathers had a bias in a positive sense toward keeping this nation founded upon its Christian principles. One more I want to share with you. Vidal versus Gerard's executors, 1844. This was a very complicated case, but the gist of it is this. A man, very wealthy man in Philadelphia died, and in his will, he stipulated that the proceeds of his estate 
would be used to support a school for orphans. They would call that a college back then, but it was a school for orphans. But he had one stipulation, and that is no Christian clergyman could be allowed to teach in his school. Well, the uh, people of uh, Pennsylvania were upset by that. They were upset that you would have a school in which Christianity couldn't be taught. But the Supreme Court of the United States upheld that man's will using this logic. They said the fact that you don't have a Christian uh, minister teaching doesn't mean the principles of Christianity can't be taught or should be taught. And this is what the Supreme Court said, quote, why may not the Bible and especially the New Testament without note or comment be read and taught as a divine revelation in the college? Its general precepts expounded, its evidences explained, and its glorious principles of morality inculcated. There is no reason not to teach the Bible in this school and to treat it as the Word of God and to teach its morality to students. Likewise, the court said in the same ruling that we don't have to worry about parody. What effect such a ruling would have on non-Christian rulings? Listen to this. Again, amazing. It is unnecessary for us, however, to consider what the legal effect of a device in Pennsylvania for the establishment of a school or college for the propagation of Judaism or deism or any other form of infidelity. Such a case is not to be presumed in a Christian country. Now that is how the early court felt about the Christian faith. It's interesting to note that the man who delivered that opinion, the majority opinion in the Girard case, was Justice Joseph Story. I remember a few years ago going through the Capitol at night and seeing a bust of Joseph Story in the old chamber where the Senate used to meet. Joseph Story was appointed to the Supreme Court in 1811 by James Madison. Now, if you know anything about American history, you know James Madison is said to have been the architect of our Constitution. So James Madison is the one who appointed Joseph Story, who said, this is a Christian nation, and talked about imposter religions. Now, do you think James Madison, who knew the Constitution <laughs> backwards and forwards, was its architect? Would he appoint some imbecile to the Supreme Court who didn't understand the purpose of the Constitution? Of course not. He appointed Joseph Story because he knew Story understood the Constitution. Later on in his career, Joseph Story went on to write a commentary on the entire United States Constitution that was for years used in law schools around the country. And in his notes on the First Amendment about the Establishment Clause, he said it is absolutely without debate that the Founder's intention in that Establishment Clause was to keep from elevating one Christian denomination over another Christian denomination. But never in the Founder's imagination did they think that would be used to make Christianity subservient to other non-Christian religions. Consider also the Christian influence in our country for the first 150 years of our nation. Did you know that for the first 150 years of our country, a school book called the New England Primer was used in schools across our country. The Primer was filled with creeds and with prayers and even with scripture verses that the students had to memorize. In fact, if you were gonna graduate from the third grade, every student had to learn this acrostic from the New England print, uh, primer. Every letter of the alphabet represented a verse that the students had to memorize. For example, A, a wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. B, better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble. C, Come unto Christ, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and he will give you rest. D, do not do the abominable thing which I hate, saith the Lord. E, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
That's what our students had to memorize in school. Can you imagine what would happen with such a textbook today? We're not even allowed to acknowledge that there might be a creator up there somewhere, that there's some intelligent designer up there who made us. Do you think that has any relationship with the increasing violence we're seeing in our schools? When you teach children that they're nothing but animals, don't be surprised when they act like animals. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But what I'm sharing with you is this was the spiritual foundation on which our nation was built. So the natural question is, what happened? What happened? How do you explain this seismic shift in the attitude toward faith in the public square that we've witnessed in these last decades? Well, first of all, the first stone that was laid in the erection of the wall of separation between church and state actually happened in 1947. This was a Supreme Court case, Everson versus the Board of Education. This is the first time the words separation of church and state were ever mentioned in a Supreme Court decision. Isn't this interesting? For the first 150 years of our nation's history, not one Supreme Court decision ever talked about the separation of church and state. The first time it was mentioned was in 1947. You have to ask, if this is such a principled and foundational doctrine of our country, why didn't the Supreme Court refer to it for 150 years? The first time it was mentioned was in the case of Everson and the Board of Education. This case dealt with the state of New Jersey using tax dollars to support religious schools. Now remember back then, most all religious schools were Catholic schools. Remember that. The chief justice of uh, the justice of the Supreme Court who delivered that decision in the Everson case was Justice Hugo Black. And Hugo Black, in that decision, talked about his desire to build a high and impregnable wall of separation between the church and the state. Now, what you need to know about Hugo Black is this. He had been a member of the Ku Klux Klan. And the only people the Ku Klux Klan hated more than black people were Catholic people. And many people now believe, including two uh, recent judges on our Supreme Court, the late Anton Scalia and Clarence Thomas, they believe that Hugo Black's wall of separation was really an expression of his anti-Catholic bigotry. He wanted to keep the Catholic Church from receiving any support whatsoever. In fact, Justice Clarice Thomas said this, quote, this doctrine of the separation of church and state, he's talking about, this doctrine born in bigotry should be buried. But there you have the first stone in 1947. Then built upon that was the second stone in 1962, Engel versus Vitale. In this case, this court ruled that students in New York City could no longer recite this simple 22-word voluntary prayer. Quote, Almighty God, we acknowledge our dependence upon thee, and we beg thy blessings upon us, our parents, our teachers, and our country. Can you imagine saying that's unconstitutional? But the court said, even though it was a to whomever it may concern prayer, not addressed to any particular God, it was still breaching the, quote, constitutional wall of separation between the church and state. In fact, the court went on to opine, quote, a union of government and religion tends to destroy government and degrade religion. That sounds so enlightened to us today. Oh, it, it destroys government and it degrades religion to have the two joined together. But remember what John Quincy Adams said, the highest glory of the American Revolution is this, that it connected in one indissoluble bond, the principles of civil government and the precepts of Christianity. Ironically, even though this court case said you cannot pray in the public school, it's interesting that even today, the United States Congress begins every session in prayer. 
I was privileged a couple of years ago to lead one of those prayers to begin the congressional session. Those prayers are recorded every day in the congressional record. You can find a copy of the prayer there in the congressional record. But in 1970, the Supreme Court said that it is unconstitutional for students to voluntarily read aloud the prayers recorded in the congressional record. That that is absolute lunacy. But that's where we're going. The third stone was laid in 1963, Abington School District versus Shemp. Uh, this is a case that said no longer could students voluntarily read 10 verses of the Bible at the beginning of each school day. Uh, the prosecution brought in so-called expert testimony that said that if portions of the New Testament were read without exclamation, they could be psychologically harmful to the students. And therefore, you can't do it. And yet compare that to what the Supreme Court had said decades earlier in 1844 in the Girard case. Why may not the Bible, especially the New Testament, be read and taught as divine revelation in the schools? Why can't its general precepts be expounded, its evidences explained, and its glorious principles of morality inculcated? Do you see the shift there? One more, well, two more. The Spain versus DeKalb County in 1967. This is a court case that let stand a lower court ruling in 1966 that said a kindergarten teacher could not any longer allow her students to recite this simple poem. We thank you for the flowers so sweet. We thank you for the food we eat. We thank you for the birds that sing. We thank you for everything. The court said, you can't say that anymore in a school. Why? Because even though this poem does not mention God, it might cause the children to think about God, and that is unconstitutional. The culminating ruling, 1980, Stone versus Graham. This is a case involving the display of the Ten Commandments in the halls of Kentucky schools. Private donors had allowed the Ten Commandments without any explanation at all, just the Ten Commandments, to be posted in the hallways of the public schools. And yet, the Supreme Court said, no longer can you do that. No longer can you post these copies of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not murder why did they say that was no longer constitutional? Listen to what the Supreme Court said, 1980, Stone versus Graham. If the posted copies of the Ten Commandments are to have any effect at all, it will induce the school children to read, meditate upon, perhaps venerate and obey the commandments. However desirable this might be as a matter of private devotion, it is not permissible, a permissible state objective under the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment. Again, how do you reconcile that with what the court had said 150 years late, earlier? Why may not the New Testament be read and taught as divine revelation and its principles of morality inculcated how do you reconcile that with the words of John Adams who said, our Constitution is made for a moral and religious people. It is totally inadequate to govern any other people. And yet now the Supreme Court says you can't even tell students they're not to lie, steal, and kill. How do you explain this shift? What has happened in the last 60 or 70 years? Has the Constitution changed? And somebody didn't tell us? No. What happened is this. We've allowed the atheist, the secularist, the infidels to pervert our Constitution into something our founders never intended. And we cannot allow that to happen any longer. It is time for us to stand up and say without apology, America was founded as a Christian nation. Now, I have to tell you, this morning I read an interesting commentary about me, 
And uh, a liberal writer was talking about this controversy in, his, in our church, and he made an amazing concession. He said, you know, Jeffers probably has a point. As you look back at the evidence, there is evidence that our nation, from the writings of the founders, from the early court opinions, was decidedly biased toward the Christian faith. He conceded that. He said, but our nation was also biased and prejudiced, and there are court rulings that supported slavery. And we don't think that is right, and we needed to change from that. We needed to change and move away from our Christian foundation as well. Well, isn't that interesting that somebody would equate slavery with following God and obedience to God as a nation? But let's just test his argument. Has it been a positive thing for us as a nation to unhitch ourselves from our Christian forefathers, to move into a secular direction? Is our society better today? are worse off today than when this assault on Christianity began 60 or 70 years ago. Well, let's look at the statistics. William Bennett, the former Secretary of Education under Ronald Reagan, back in the 90s, released what he called the Index of Leading Cultural Indicators to show what happened in our nation between 1960 and 1990 when this all-out assault was beginning upon our Christian nation. When you saw all of these antagonistic court rulings and the abdication of prayer and Bible reading and the Ten Commandments from the schools, what happened during that 30-year period? During that period of time, quote, there was a 419% increase in illegitimate births, a quadrupling in divorce rates, a more than 200% increase in teenage suicide, a drop of almost 80 points in the SAT scores, and a 560% increase in violent crime. And today, today, that pattern still continues. Today, over 10 million teenagers in the U.S. drink alcohol regularly, and 20% of those engage in binge drinking. Nearly 2,800 children die each year as a result of gun violence and another 14,300 are injured. Nearly one million babies were murdered in the womb last year, and one in four women in the U.S. will have aborted at least one of their children by the age of 45. In 2011, over a half a million teenagers became pregnant, with about 30% of those pregnancies ending in an abortion. Are those statistics just a coincidence? Not at all. Not when you consider God's warning to his own people, the nation of Israel, a warning that is just as applicable to us today as it was 3,000 years ago. In Hosea 4, verse 6, God says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you from being my priest. Since you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. God is no respecter of people or nations. The nation that reverences God will be blessed by God. The nation that rejects God will be rejected by God. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. As I close today, I decided not to close this message with a Bible verse, or even a quote from a rabid conservative fundamentalist. Instead, I want to close this quote from a very unlikely source, a man named Earl Warren. In the 1950s and 1960s, Earl Warren was the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. Growing up in the South, I was led to believe that Earl Warren was a villain of the American people. He was a liberal. He was a communist pinko. That's how people in the South referred to Earl Warren. As I look back, the reason they hated him was because he believed in racial equality. That had as much to do with it as anything. But Earl Warren, an avowed liberal in many ways, 
gave this assessment in 1954 of our nation's Christian heritage. Listen to what he said. I believe no one can read the history of our country without realizing the good book and the spirit of the Savior have from the beginning been our guiding geniuses. Whether we look to the first charter of Virginia or the charter of New England or the charter of Massachusetts Bay or the fundamental orders of Connecticut, the same object is present, a Christian land governed by Christian principles. I believe the entire Bill of Rights came into being because of the knowledge our forefathers had of the Bible and their belief in it. Freedom of belief, of expression, of assembly, of petition, the dignity of the individual, the sanctity of the home, equal justice under the law, and the reservation of powers to the people. I like to believe that we are living today in the spirit of the Christian religion. I like also to believe that as long as we do so, no great harm can come to our country. The nation that reverences God will be blessed by God. The nation that rejects God will be rejected by God. The choice is ours. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. Today I've been talking about our nation. But nobody goes to heaven based on their nationality. Nobody goes to heaven based on their race. Nobody goes to heaven based on their church membership. Nobody goes to heaven in a group. We go one by one based on our relationship to God. The only people who enter into heaven are those who have been forgiven of their sins. And there's only one way to have God's forgiveness in your life, and that's by trusting in Jesus as your Savior. Today, he wants to offer you a relationship with himself that begins now and extends past your death throughout eternity. He wants to offer you the forgiveness of your sins so that you can spend now and eternity with him in heaven. But there's only one way to heaven. There aren't many ways. It's through faith in Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Do you know with absolute certainty that when you close your eyes in death, you will be welcomed into God's presence? If not, today I want to invite you to receive as a gift, the greatest gift of all, the gift of God's forgiveness by trusting in Jesus as your Savior. Today, if you'd like to make that decision, I want to invite you right now to pray this simple prayer with me as I pray it out loud, knowing that God is listening to you. Would you pray this with me? Dear God, thank you for loving me. I know I have failed you in so many ways. And I'm truly sorry for the sins in my life. But I believe what I've heard today. That you love me so much. You sent Jesus to die for me. To take the punishment that I deserve for my sins when he died on the cross. And today I'm trusting in what Jesus did for me. Not my good works, but in what Jesus did for me. That's what I'm trusting in to save me from my sins. Thank you for forgiving me and help me to live the rest of my life for you. Father, we thank you for sending Christ to do for us what we could never do for ourselves. Thank you for those who are ready to come, some to trust in Christ for the first time, others ready to join our church. I pray no one would resist your invitation. In Jesus' name, amen. America is in the midst of critical events, the likes of which we've never seen before. In these increasingly divided times leading up to the 2020 election, now more than ever, we need to join together and pray for America. From best-selling author Dr. Robert Jeffress comes Praying for America, a collection of 40 inspirational stories and 40 intentional prayers for our great nation. Request Praying for America by Dr. Robert Jeffress when you give a generous gift to support the ministry of Pathway to Victory today.